Hey everyone, welcome back. Today we are going to be talking about perceptual interpretation. So this is getting toward the end of our sensation and perception unit. We've talked about our sensations and how that is the detection of external stimuli from light waves, sound waves, chemicals in the air and chemicals in the food we eat, pressure against our skin. We've talked about how that information is sent to our brain, how our brain organizes that information, and then finally today, how do we interpret it? How do we interpret these different particular perceptions? And so today to start, we're going to talk about this kind of weird, interesting condition. I don't really want to call it a disorder. It's not debilitating or anything, but it is this really fascinating condition that deals with sensations and perceptions. And this condition is known as synesthesia. And it's possible that you've heard of synesthesia before. But for those of you who haven't, the idea behind synesthesia is that one particular stimulus, let's say a light wave, well, naturally that produces one perception, a perception of, of sight. But with synesthesia, a sensation such as a light wave may produce not only the perception of sight, but also the perception of sound or the perception of taste. In other words, one sense can equal multiple per perceptions of different senses. Think of it almost like if you walk into a house and you turn on a light switch and it turns on the lights above, or you walk into a house, you turn on a light switch, not only does it turn on the lights above, but it turns on the dishwasher. So you have one stimulus equaling multiple perceptions. It's this kind of cross wiring of the brain where you have someone who perhaps can hear color or you have someone who can see sound. That doesn't normally happen. Uh, they're not hallucinating. They are experiencing these multiple perceptions um, given one particular stimuli. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about this and watch a video about this in class. But I like using synesthesia um, as this kind of bridge into the interesting elements of perceptual interpretation, making sense of the sensations that are sent to our brain. So let's talk a little bit about this idea called perceptual set. For one reason or another, sometimes students struggle with remembering what perceptual set is all about. And so it might be worth adding in your notes that another way to think about perceptual set is the phrase perceptual expectancy. What do you expect to happen? And what we have found is that your expectation will strongly impact your perception. Remember back when we talked about bottom-up and top-down processing, and you may recall that as we were talking about top-down processing, all of the different elements that impact perception, I talked about things like memories and experience, but I also talked about expectation. Well, there's a name for that specifically, and that is perceptual set. If you expect to perceive something, you are more likely to perceive it in that particular way. So. If you look at this kind of chart that I have in front of you or this image that you have in front of yourself, the middle image here, right, you can likely perceive that as a 13 or as the letter B. And it's highly dependent on what you expect to see. And so this is kind of weird, but if you can imagine just seeing the, the letters going horizontally, you probably wouldn't think twice about that image in the middle of being the letter B. Or if you just saw the numbers going vertically, you certainly wouldn't think twice about that image in the middle being a 13. If you expect to perceive something, you likely will perceive it that way. It's what we call a perceptual set. And they are based off of this idea of schemas. Schema is a word you're gonna hear often in this class. Schema essentially is how we organize information into our mind. You can almost think of a schema as a file folder. And so in our mind, we have these schemas for all of the different um, things that we see and witness and experience in this world. For example, you have in your mind a schema for what the human face looks like. And in that schema, you have through memory and experience, two eyes, a nose, a mouth, a general idea of kind of an average face right? It's your schema, how your mind organizes your perception of a face. So if we go to this next slide here, if you look at this face, probably looks relatively normal, right? That's Madonna, only Madonna's been inverted. And then the idea here is, 
if we spin Madonna around, ah, terrifying, right? You likely didn't notice that at first because it fit your scheme of for a face. When she was inverted, obviously photoshopped with her eyes and her and her mouth to be upside down, it didn't look off to us when we first saw the picture. It didn't look off where we weird. It, it, it fit our schema. When we turn it upside down, all of a sudden we can notice, oh, something is clearly wrong here. So a schema, I, I have there kind of a textbook definition, structured internal representation of an object or image acquired through perception. You can put that in your notes, but that might not make a lot of sense, right? You want to make sure that your notes make sense. What is a schema? A schema is how we think about or organize information. And so when we are forming perceptions, our perceptions will fit into schemas. Our perceptions will be, when we're interpreting incoming sensations, it will fit into what we believe it should fit into, into these nice file folders of, yep, that's what a face looks like. So that's how I'm going to perceive it. That's what that song sounds like. So that's how I will perceive the song. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, let's put it into some application, right? So there's this whole branch of psychology that we call human factors psychology. And human factors psychology is built off this idea of schemas. We have a, a, an internal representation for what something should look like, how something should operate. Well, using this knowledge, researchers, advertisers, uh, they can create products that are more user-friendly. They make sense to the mind because they fit within our schema. I want you to look at the two uh, stoves that are on your screen here. This stove on the left has these little um, burners, right? The knobs on the front. And you've maybe, if you have a stove like this at home, you've maybe experienced this. If we wanted to turn on the stove where this pan is, well, it's probably one of these left burners, but we're not sure which one. We kind of have to lean down and look at the little picture and say, is it the one on the left or does that one do the back burner? Is it this one over here? Is that one the front burner? We have to kind of look down because it's not very intuitive, right? It doesn't fit this nice schema for how things should operate. So we have to then look at the diagram to see which one to turn on. Whereas if you look at this product on the right, um, it makes sense. You don't need a description. You don't need a, a map to figure it out. If you want to turn on this front left burner, you just turn this front left knob. It, it's intuitive. It's user friendly. It uses human factors psychology. And we see examples of this everywhere. We see examples of this with your phone, right? If you think about it, if you're looking at pictures, right, and you want to go to the next picture, you just kind of swipe to the right and the picture moves to the right. Well, it wasn't always that way. I remember my very first touch phone, right? And how intuitive it was, how easy it was if I wanted to zoom in on something. And the idea of kind of pinching your fingers together, right? Or moving your fingers apart to zoom in and to zoom out. That's very intuitive. You don't need a lot of instruction for how to do that. If you want something to be larger, you can kind of make it larger. It's human factors psychology. It's using how our brain perceives information the way that it should operate and it creates products that work that way. Take a car, for example, right? We'll use a kind of a third example here, a car and a car's turn signal. Well, if I'm driving my car and I want to turn left or right and I use my turn signal, it is intuitive where the turn signal will go up as my arm would go up to turn right or the turn signal would go down as my arm would turn the other direction to go left. Right? So we make sure that the turn signal matches the way that our, that our arms and hands are going to move on a steering wheel. Imagine, for those of you who drive, imagine if it was the other way around. Imagine if when I was trying to turn right, if I had to turn the turn signal down. It doesn't make sense. It's not intuitive. So psychologists and uh, people who design products, they have come together to create user-friendly products based off perceptual schemas. So as we are receiving more information, it's also important when it comes time to interpret it, how we compare that to surrounding information. And so there's this idea of context effects, right? Context effects are really interesting. Here we have one stimulus 
and it can create different perceptions based on surrounding information. It sounds like something we've maybe talked about before. We've talked a little bit about how changing stimuli creates one perception. Now we have the same stimuli change, ha having different perceptions, right? If we have one stimulus that creates different perceptions, that's context effects. If we have a changing stimulus creating one perception, that's perceptual constancy, right? Remember the story about if the pen gets further away, the sensation is changing, but the perception remains the same. You can think of context effects as kind of being the opposite of that. Here we have the same stimuli, for example, this blue circle. It's the same stimulus, but your perception is going to change depending on the context. So if you wear a, um, let's say you wear a, a gray shirt and you, have, you wear a gray shirt with blue jeans and then you wear the exact same gray shirt with a pair of, of khakis or a pair of, of black jeans, well, that gray shirt may appear different, even though it isn't, even though it is the same stimulus, it may appear to be different because the context is now different. So with context effects, the stimulus itself hasn't changed. The perception has changed because the surrounding information has in fact changed. And then our last slide today is going to talk about what's called perceptual adaptation. Perceptual adaptation, not to be confused with sensory adaptation. Similar idea, but where this takes place is what's important. Perceptual adaptation is this idea that we have changed a sensation and then we have quote unquote gotten used to it. So there's this picture here of this man and this man is wearing these inverted goggles. And so you put these goggles on and now up is down, down is up, left is right, you get the idea. Well, when you first put on those inverted goggles, you're disoriented. But after a while, you get used to it. You start to figure out up is down, down is up. You can almost think about it if you've ever tried to, and I don't recommend doing this, but if you've ever tried to like cut your hair in the mirror, and so you've got the mirror in front of you, you've got a mirror in one hand, you've got some scissors and you're trying to figure it out, don't do this. But if you've ever tried it and it's like, if I move my, my hand up in the mirror, it's moving down and you're just getting confused. And then over time, you, got, you start to get used, get, st ugh, you start to get used to um, how to move and, and the perception itself. So perceptual adaptation, the sensation has changed. And then over time, our perception gets used to that changed stimuli. Um, if you want to kind of re remember back when we talked about sensory adaptation, sensory adaptation is when we have a constant, like a hot tub, a constant sensation, then over time we get used to the constant sen uh, sensation. Perceptual adaptation, we have now changed the sensation and we get used to it. All right kind of stumbled over my words for this lecture. Uh, if you have questions, which you probably do, send me an email, let me know, and I will do my best to help you out. And best of luck, everyone.